In this presentation, I want to talk about the application technique for therapeutic ultrasound. The application technique is critical for an effective treatment, and this is probably why most treatments that are not effective fail, is because of poor application technique. So this is critical to uh, using the modality effectively. As we discussed in the ultrasound properties presentation, you need to have some sort of coupling agent between the transducer and your client's skin. There's a number of different ways to do that. You can have direct coupling with ultrasound gel. Uh, you can use water as your coupling agent by doing it underwater in a water bath. Uh, there's bladder coupling and there's using a gel pad for coupling. Uh, there's also uh, something that more recently came on the market called the gel shot, and we'll talk about that later too. In the presentation on ultrasound properties, you'll remember that we uh, talked about body lotions or some uh, medication creams uh, blocking ultrasound entirely. And so given that potential, it's probably a good idea to wash your client's skin with soap and water or at least cleanse it with an alcohol wipe uh, before you apply the ultrasound to make sure there's nothing there that's going to limit the transmission. When you use direct coupling and you apply your ultrasound gel, you want to avoid getting bubbles in that gel because air uh, will, again, pretty much stop the ultrasound transmission. Uh, so avoid kind of the pile of spaghetti uh, when you're squeezing your ultrasound gel onto the client. I like to uh, do something that looks more like a soft serve ice cream or, you know, the Dairy Queen um, kind of little pyramid so that you don't get a lot of bubbles uh, in the gel uh, that's going to limit your ultrasound transmission. When you are actually applying the ultrasound, whether that's with direct gel coupling or underwater or bladder or a gel pad, uh, regardless of the coupling technique, you have to keep the sound head moving. Um, you need to keep the sound head moving for a few reasons. Uh, one is to avoid uh, overheating with any spots of high intensity within the beam. So remember, we talked about beam non-uniformity in the ultrasound properties presentation. Uh, and if you have a, a spot of high intensity somewhere in that ultrasound beam, you want to keep that moving. You don't want to leave that in one place. Also, you want to avoid standing waves. We talked about this in the ultrasound properties presentation as well, uh, because standing waves will uh, increase the intensity or amplitude of the ultrasound. And uh, by moving the sound head, you prevent that from happening. And so a stationary sound head will likely result in uh, pain if it's left there long enough and or tissue damage. Uh, so you want to keep it moving. And that is true whether you are using a continuous duty cycle or a pulsed duty cycle. Uh, regardless of whether the ultrasound is continuous or pulsed, you want to keep the sound head moving throughout the treatment. Don't leave it stationary. The movement that you do could be either kind of longitudinal or a side to side motion, or it could be kind of moving it in a circle. I kind of prefer the side to side motion. I think that's easier to uh, keep within a limited space. And it's also um, helpful, I think, because a lot of times the tissues that we're trying to target are somewhat longitudinal. So if you move side to side over that tissue, then um, you're going to stay right over it. As far as how quickly you move the sound head, whether you're doing little circles or moving it side to side, uh, generally the consensus is that a, a speed of four centimeters per second is about right. Uh, the thing that's important to realize, however, is that the speed of the sound head movement while you move it back and forth does not influence the dosage. Uh, it doesn't change any of your other parameters and therefore uh, it will not change the heating effect whether you do it slowly or quickly. 
we know that the speed doesn't change the heating effects of ultrasound because uh, Weaver and colleagues in 2006 did a study to look at just that. And so in this study, they had 11 college students and they implanted uh, essentially little ther thermometers uh, in their calf muscles and then did ultrasound. Uh, so they measured then using those thermometers, the total temperature rise in the muscle bellies uh, with three transducer velocities. So they were moving it side to side and in one case they moved it, what they said was kind of a slow movement, two to three centimeters a second, uh, then kind of a medium movement, three to four centimeters a second, and then quite a quick movement, seven to eight centimeters a second, but always staying within uh, this, you know, transcribed or prescribed uh, coverage area. So the parameters that Weaver and colleagues used for this experiment, uh, they used one megahertz ultrasound, 1.5 watts per square centimeter spatial average intensity, and a continuous duty cycle. The ERA was five square centimeters and the BNR of the sound head that they used was 2.1 to one, which is a pretty low BNR. Uh, the treatment area was described as two times the diameter of the sound head. So that would then equate to 2.3 times the ERA. Uh, and they used a little template uh, inside of which they moved the transducer in order to ensure a consistent treatment area under all three speed conditions. And they treated for 10 minutes with direct coupling with ultrasound gel. And so here's what they found. Uh, overall, uh, across all conditions, there was about a 5.1 degrees Celsius temperature increase with those parameters and the speed of the sound head movement didn't make any difference. There was no statistically significant difference in heating effect between the three different velocity conditions. As you can see in the little table here, they all started out in the high 37 degree Celsius uh, area uh, inside the muscle belly and they all ended up somewhere around 43 degrees Celsius uh, inside the muscle belly. And none of those were statistically different than any other um, across speed. There was, of course, a main effect for time. Uh, having done it for 10 minutes, um, you would expect to have a heating effect. So the bottom line of that Weaver study is that speed doesn't matter as long as you keep it moving. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat to that because the, if you move the sound head quickly, uh, the therapist is more likely than to uh, get too big with their coverage area. If you're moving it quickly, uh, it's a little harder to uh, keep that coverage area limited and consistent. And if you increase the coverage area, uh, then the energy kind of per area or the energy density uh, is going to be decreased because you're putting that same dose into a larger area of the body and so you're not going to have as much heating. Uh, so the key is to uh, you know keep your coverage area limited and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next slides. As you are moving the sound head uh, it needs to be kept in a consistent flat plane. So the surface of the transducer or the sound head should be flat against the skin and and kept you know parallel with the skin as you as you move it you want to visualize that target tissue whatever it is you're trying to warm up with a, the ultrasound and usually with ultrasound that is a specific uh tissue target uh, and being mindful of the collimated nature of that ultrasound beam that it you know it goes in a cylinder it doesn't go anywhere else uh, you need to keep that target tissue within that uh, collimated ultrasound beam or within that little cylinder uh, that you're trying to visualize. The uh, other thing you want to avoid is tilting or rocking with the sound head um, for a couple of reasons. One, if you're tilting or rocking the sound head, you're less likely to keep the uh, target tissue within the ultrasound beam. But uh, secondly, if you tilt or rock the sound head, uh, you get increased reflection of the ultrasound 
uh, when you hit a tissue interface, for example, between the ultrasound gel and your skin. Um, tilting it as much or as little as you know 15 degrees off of parallel will uh, result in a lot of reflection and you won't get uh, very much happening in terms of the heating effects you're hoping to get from your ultrasound. When you are using direct coupling with uh, ultrasound gel, it's important that you select a sound head that is the appropriate size for the body part that you're uh, trying to ultrasound. Uh, so you need to have the entire uh, physical sound head coupled to the body part with ultrasound gel. You don't want part of the ultrasound head kind of hanging over outside of the, or over you know, the edge of the tissue that you're working on. The whole head has to be coupled to the body part. Having said that, you generally want to use the largest ultrasound head that you can couple and keep coupled while you're moving it uh, because the larger ultrasound head will have a larger ERA and therefore your little cylinder of ultrasound will be uh, wider and you're more likely to keep your target tissue within that ultrasound uh, cylinder, that collimated ultrasound beam. So if you know you have a couple of sizes and you think you can keep them both consistently coupled while you're doing your ultrasound, it, you wanna choose the larger one to uh, make sure you're covering as much tissue as you can with the ultrasound. Uh, the ERA should be about half of your treatment area. So if you're trying to treat an area, say that is two centimeters by five centimeters, which would be a 10 square centimeter treatment area, uh, you're going to then want to have an ERA that is half of that. Um, so basically five square centimeter ERA for a 10 square centimeter coverage area. So speaking of coverage area, there's a lot of uh, recommendations out there, but in the last, you know, five to 10 years or so, uh, it, it has, there's been more consensus. Uh, generally, we want a coverage area that is two times the ERA of your transducer. And in most of the research in say the past 20 years or so with ultrasound, um, a coverage area of two times the ERA with a side-to-side -side movement has been used in those uh, research studies. Um, so generally, the recommendation is maybe two to three times the ERA, certainly no more than four times the ERA. Two times the ERA is, is a good um, thing to aim for. If you were to cover four times the ERA of the sound head, so you're covering a larger area as you move it, you're going to have um, a lot less rapid heating uh, and a lot quicker cooling of the tissues. Uh, which is, you know, counterproductive if you're trying to heat with ultrasound. Um, it's important to understand also that two times the ERA of the sound head is different from two times the diameter of the sound head. All right, so we'll take a look at that in the next couple of slides. So here's one example of the coverage area. So if you look at the, the white solid white circle down below, uh, that solid white circle obviously depends on how big your monitor is, but that solid white circle, uh, let's just say that has a five square centimeter uh, area. So that solid white circle would represent the ERA of five square centimeters in an ultrasound transducer that has a five square centimeter ERA. Um, if you wanted to kind of move that uh, ultrasound in circles on the client's body uh, as you're applying the ultrasound, going with two times the ERA, you want a coverage area that's 10 square centimeters. And if that white solid circle is five square centimeters, the yellow circle around it is 10 square centimeters. You'll see that that is not much bigger than the five square centimeter circle. The reason for that is the area of a circle is, hopefully you'll remember, is pi times the radius squared. So as the, the radius gets larger, that is the circle gets larger, the area increases exponentially. 
So uh, it's not a whole lot bigger than your ERA if you're moving in a circle to get that 10 square centimeter coverage area. Here's another example of coverage area uh, when you're applying your ultrasound. So here again, we have kind of the white solid circle that represents, let's say, a five square centimeter ERA. And uh, if you are simply going to slide your sound head side to side for the movement, um, this diagram where, uh, with the yellow outline shows you the boundaries in which you should be sliding that um, sound head. So basically back and forth, side to side, and uh, it kind of works out to about three quarters of the diameter of the uh, ERA is uh, how far you're going to slide it side to side. So again, it's not two diameters, it's like a diameter and another three quarter diameter. Uh, that will define your treatment area if you're sliding side to side. Here we have uh, an improper coverage area illustrated. So here we're, you see we're doing two times the diameter of the ERA. Again, the ERA being represented by the, the white uh, solid circles. And if you did two diameters, um, you'll see you have obviously one ERA, two ERAs, but then you have this kind of black hourglass sort of shape in between the two uh, that you're also covering. So it actually ends up that you cover about two and a, two and a quarter times the ERA if you're sliding uh, side to side, um, two times the diameter of the ERA. So uh, that's not you know a huge problem or hugely egregious. Uh, if you're thinking two to three times the ERA, you're still doing, you know, okay with that. Uh, but just to give you the sense of um, two times the ERA is not two times the diameter. Where things uh, really start to get out of hand is if you did two times the diameter of the sound head uh, in a circular motion. So here you, again, you have the white solid circle, which is the ERA or represents the ERA, let's say again, that says five square centimeters. If you were to move that in a circle uh, that had two times the diameter of your ERA, you would end up with a coverage area of about four times the ERA. And you'll remember uh, that if you cover four times the ERA, you don't get as much heating, it heats slower and it cools down a lot faster. So this you would definitely want to avoid. And you, certainly wouldn't want to get any larger than this. So here we have uh, a study that was done in 2000 by Garrett and colleagues. And you can see in this picture, the thermistors, there's three of them, uh, inserted into the muscle belly, uh, taking you know a live temperature reading, essentially, of the temperature inside that muscle belly. And in this case, they uh, tried a coverage area that was 40, 4 is 0, 40 times the ERA of the sound head. It's indicated with a little kind of black dotted line there. If you have a hard time seeing that, um, this is basically the perimeter that they were going with. Uh, and with a coverage of 40 times the ERA of the sound head, even with all your other, you know, um, parameters being appropriate, you are going to get essentially no heating whatsoever in that muscle. Uh, because you're just covering far too large an area. Uh, nonetheless, you may have seen uh, somebody in the clinic actually you know, covering this big of an area uh, with ultrasound and thinking they're doing something effective, but uh, what they're really doing is just a very expensive massage. They're not really delivering any therapeutic effect from the ultrasound. So there's a uh, discussion in therapy circles about the temperature of the gel that you're using as a coupling agent. Uh, and you know some people will say, well, it should be cooler because then it's more dense. It's going to transmit the ultrasound better. And no, it should be hotter. Anyway, um, the research indicates that if you use 
cooler gel or cold gel, um, you're going to get decreased surface heating just because the gel is cooling that surface. Um, it's not really going to change the effects of the ultrasound deeper. Um, heated gel, again, won't really change the effect of the ultrasound in the deep tissues, uh, but heated gel can be difficult to work with just because it's runnier. And so you're going to end up with, um, you know, your gel kind of oozing out or running down the uh, body part more if you heat the gel. It's a little more comfortable, but it can be hard to work with. So room temperature gel is probably, you know, the good compromise and uh, is certainly what I would use when I'm doing therapeutic ultrasound. So now that we've gone through all of the guidelines uh, for application technique for direct coupling, I have some videos to show you poor technique and better technique. So uh, I have what's wrong with this picture. It's actually what's wrong with this video. I'm going to play the video here. And so here's the video and applying the ultrasound. What's wrong with that video? And yes, that is a video. <laughs> All right. And the, what's wrong with it is they're not moving the sound head. You shouldn't do that. You always have to keep the sound head moving, whether it's continuous ultrasound or pulsed ultrasound. Okay, in this one, I'm going to play this video, and we have another, uh, you know, ultrasound application. And the, the question is, what's wrong here? What is the therapist doing incorrectly? And what's incorrect here is that they aren't able to couple that entire sound head to the body part. You'll see that sound head is kind of hanging off the, the top of the thumb. You need the entire sound head to be coupled uh, while you're moving it around. So basically, it's too big of a sound head for that body part. So here's a third example. I'll play the video here. And you can kind of look at that and say, well, what's wrong with that picture? And what's wrong with that picture is they're covering far too large an area. It's probably close to, you know, three sound head diameters put together. And then you also have some, some up and down motion, um, you know, transverse to the forearm. And so you probably have four or five plus uh, times the ERA that you're covering there and you're going to really decrease the effectiveness of your treatment. So here's another example. I'll play this video for you and see what you think. So the thing that's not going well in this video is there's a lot of tilting and rocking going on. So that uh, little collimated ultrasound beam is not staying on your target tissue. Uh, it's kind of getting shown all over the place within the forearm. Uh, also, that tilting of the sound head is going to cause reflection and you aren't actually going to get the ultrasound into the tissues uh, very well. Finally, in this uh, little video here, besides all the tilting and rocking, uh, the coverage area was, was a bit too big. So here's a, another video, example number five. And the question is, what's wrong with this picture? And um, if you said everything is wrong with that picture, you'd, you'd probably be accurate. So there's a lot of tilting and rocking going on. Um, you're covering probably two times the diameter of the transducer or sound head, uh, maybe even a little bigger than that. So this is probably, you know, four plus the times of the ERA for a coverage area, which is too big. Um, in addition to that, um, you can't really see it on this side, but on the far side, which is usually where the problem occurs when you're applying ultrasound, it looks like on the far side that ultrasound head may be coming off of the skin, so it's not staying coupled. Um, you have to be really uh, aware when you're doing ultrasound and moving it that, you know, not only do you keep this part you can see coupled, 
but the part that's on the far side, you want to make sure you're keeping coupled as well. And here's a sixth example, and I'll play the video here for you, and you can decide what's wrong with that picture. All right, so what we going on? What we have going on here is, well, a couple of things. Uh, probably covering too large of an area with that uh, one centimeter ERA sound head. Uh, but also you can see the sound head is becoming uncoupled. So uh, you'll see the kind of that dark uh, surface of the sound head coming off of the skin. So you're not completely coupling. There's also a little bit of tilting going on here. So that's not all that great either. This one centimeter uh, or one square centimeter ERA sound head is an appropriate sound head to use uh, at that thumb metacarpal joint or I'm sorry, thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint, uh, but the technique isn't good. So all of those other examples were me, you know, trying to do it wrong and taking a video. Here's a, a picture from a, a physical therapy clinic. And just to kind of show you what's wrong with that picture. So there's a number of things that aren't going on so well there. Uh, you're seeing some tilting, certainly, and some rocking. Uh, you're, she's covering far too large an area. Uh, it's not clear that she has any structure in mind that she's trying to ultrasound. She's just kind of going all over on the shoulder. So uh, if there is a particular structure she's trying to ultrasound, she's missing it you know, the majority of the time. So here we have a video of, of what would be better technique. I'll play the video. And here you can see uh, we're keeping the surface of the sound head in a nice flat plane, uh, moving it in a circular direction, but keeping that within two times the ERA of the sound head. Uh, so that looks just about right for that. Uh, no tilting, no rocking. We're keeping it coupled throughout. Uh, so that would be better technique if you are going to uh, use the, the movement uh, in a circle. Uh, you could also go side to side, uh, which is actually what I prefer to do, but this is a good video of technique, uh, good technique with using a circular motion. Here's an example of better technique. Again, looking at that um, thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint, uh, you'll see I'm keeping the, the sound head uh, in more of a flat plane than I was in the previous video, uh, keeping it coupled not getting too big or covering too large an area. Uh, so again, if you're doing kind of a circular motion, that would be an example of better technique. Um, or you could go side to side, which again is what I actually tend to prefer to do myself. So all of that that we've talked about so far, uh, you know, is in relation to direct coupling with ultrasound gel. Uh, let's talk about some other techniques here. One is doing the ultrasound underwater in a water bath immersion. immersion. And basically you're gonna do this when you have a body part that's contoured such that you just can't get the ultrasound head coupled to it very well. Or the ultrasound head you have is too big, so you can't keep it coupled with gel, uh, then you might do it underwater. If you're going to do it underwater, you want to use a plastic or a ceramic container, but not a metal container as the metal will reflect the ultrasound. And if there's a curve in that metal container, it'll reflect that ultrasound to a focal point uh, where you're gonna have really high intensity. Uh, room temperature water is uh, good to use. And then, you know, you'll hold the sound head uh, a little distance away from the body part that you're doing it. Um, half a centimeter to a centimeter. I've even seen some books say, you know, a couple centimeters is good. Uh, but you want to uh, have it just a little bit away from the body part. And then the sound head is going to get some bubbles on it uh, that just kind of um, come out of the water because of the ultrasound. And uh, you'll just want to wipe those bubbles off, you know, when they accumulate. If you are doing the ultrasound underwater, um, all of the techniques we talked about before in terms of direct coupling 
you know, related to the uh, amount of area you cover, keeping the sound head moving, uh, keeping the sound head in, uh, you know, a flat, consistent plane. All of those will also apply to doing ultrasound um, underwater. Coupling through uh, tap water is about half as efficient than direct coupling is. So it's not something you're going to want to do a lot, but um, if you have to, you know, this is how it's done. But uh, so with the same parameters that you might use for direct coupling with gel, you'll get half the heating if you're doing it underwater. Another way to uh, couple when the, particularly when the contour of the body part isn't flat, uh, and so therefore it's really hard with um, direct coupling with gel to, you know, keep enough gel there so you don't get an air gap and that kind of a thing. Um, and that would be bladder coupling. So bladder coupling, basically, you're going to get something full of water, all right? It could be like a, a balloon, like a latex balloon, or you could use a, a glove and, uh, if, you know, like a, a nitro glove like you would use in the hospital and fill it with water. Uh, you want to get all the air out um, because you don't want air bubbles, obviously, between your sound head and the body part. But uh, you would then have ultrasound gel on the body part. You would put the water balloon or glove or whatever you have filled with water on top of that. And then you would put gel on top of the balloon and then you would ultrasound on top of the balloon. So uh, this is obviously pretty involved. I don't think many people do it. Uh, but just to uh, let you know that it is possible to do it, and this is how it's done. Again, if you're going to uh, do the bladder coupling, all of those previous techniques that we talked about in terms of keeping the coverage area two to three times the ERA of the sound head, uh, keeping the sound head in a consistent flat plane that is parallel to the skin surface, uh, keeping the sound head moving, all of that applies uh, if you're using bladder coupling as well. Um, there is no in vivo, that is no in the real life human being research uh, that looks at the efficiency of bladder coupling. Um, given that just doing it underwater reduces the efficacy by about half, um, you would think that bladder coupling is probably the same or probably even less because in, dish, in addition to going through the water, you have now two more interfaces uh, with the, the latex or nitrile or vinyl or whatever the glove or balloon is made out of. So probably going to be fairly inefficient in terms of transmitting ultrasound. But again, it, it is done. So The other thing that is used sometimes uh, for coupling is this thing called a Aquaflex gel pad. And it's it's basically kind of looks like a big hockey puck. Um, it's about two centimeters thick or almost an inch thick and, and probably, you know, four or five inches in diameter. And uh, you're going to use this again when the body, the contour of the body part you're trying to ultrasound isn't flat and you can't couple very well with your flat sound head. So what you're going to do with this, with the Aquaflex gel pad, is you're going to put a bunch of gel on the surface of the skin, and then you're going to put the gel pad on top of that, and then on top of the gel pad, you now have a flat surface for your ultrasound head, and uh, but you'll put some gel on top of the ultrasound or the yeah the gel pad as well um, to couple your ultrasound head to the gel pad and you'll be doing it over the gel pad, which will then couple with the body part through the, the gel that is on the body part. Um, basically, you would do this if you're, you're trying to ultrasound something that you know has kind of a concave shape. Um, for example, next to your uh, Achilles tendon, you know, there's this kind of concavity. You could fill that concavity with the ultrasound gel, put the gel pad on top of it, put some gel on top of the gel pad, and then ultrasound over that if you're trying to ultrasound the Achilles tendon. Again, the techniques about coverage area, keeping the ultrasound head in a consistent flat plane, keeping it moving, all of those apply to uh, using an ultrasound gel pad as well. 
So some research in terms of using the gel pad and how efficient that is. Um, Bishop and colleagues, 2004, uh, found no difference between coupling just with ultrasound gel versus doing the uh, Aquaflex gel pad as I just described um, in temperature rise. So the Aquaflex gel pad was just as good as ultrasound gel alone for coupling. Um, however, if you use the Aquaflex gel pad and you don't put gel between the skin and the pad, uh, then you have quite a bit less heating um, simply because the gel pad can't, um, you know, contact the skin perfectly. It is, you know, it's a little bit stiff. It doesn't um, contour into the, the skin uh, contours nearly as well as just gel would. Um, so it's important to have gel between the skin and the Aquaflex gel pad, as well as ultrasound gel on top of the pad, um, between the pad and the transducer. Uh, Draper and colleagues in 2010 uh, did a study, and then what they found that direct coupling with just ultrasound gel uh, was twice as efficient as the two centimeter thick uh, gel or Aquaflex pad. Uh, again, over that Achilles tendon where you have that concavity. But in that study, they didn't put gel between the pad and the skin. So uh, most likely they weren't getting good coupling between the gel pad and the skin. And that would account uh, for the inefficiency of using the gel pad in that particular study. He also found that a one centimeter thick uh, Aquaflex pad that they had specially made, you know, was more efficient than the two centimeter thick pad uh, and concluded that two centimeters is too thick, but I think that it's just a po it's just a um, problem of the stiffness of the pad. A one centimeter thick pad is going to be less stiff, more flexible than a two centimeter thick pad, and therefore will contour better to the skin. Um, I think that's what was actually going on there. So you have to have a gel between this Aquaflex gel pad and your skin if you're going to use one. Then there's this uh, thing called a gel shot, which is basically uh, kind of a, a little gel pad or gel disc that is actually attached to the ultrasound transducer with a little plastic retaining ring. Um, these gel shots are uh, single use, you throw them away. Um, you do reuse the retaining ring um, across patients. So that is a concern in terms of infection control. That retaining ring isn't the easiest thing to clean. Um, so that's a little bit of a concern. As far as efficiency or heating effect using the gel shot, uh, what they found was with one megahertz ultrasound, uh, the gel shot uh, heated about th one third more than just plain old direct coupling with gel. So you actually got better heating than you did with direct coupling with gel with one megahertz ultrasound. With three megahertz ultrasound, uh, they did not find any difference between using the gel shot uh, versus using direct coupling with ultrasound gel, um, which is kind of an interesting uh, finding. Uh, overall, the gel shot, I'm not sure personally that it's worth it, given the expense, uh, the difficulty with infection control with that plastic retaining ring. Um, however, certainly if you're trying to ultrasound something that uh, isn't, say, on top of the uh, body surface, but you're like trying to get under something to ultrasound uh, something. So, you know, if you're, I don't know, trying to get at, you know, somebody's calf muscle or something while they're seated rather than having them prone, um, the gel shot would be nice because it's not going to run off like ultrasound gel would. Um, so from that perspective, if you can't get your client in a position where the ultrasound gel is going to stay on top of it, but it's going to run off because of gravity. In that case, the gel shot might be a handy thing to use. And here are the references on this slide and the next slide for this part of the presentation. Here's the rest of the references for this part of the presentation.